Good morning, church. Uh, Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this morning, Lord. I thank you for your church. Lord Father, I pray as I open my mouth that you fill it. Lord, I pray that it is not by power or might, but it is by your spirit, Lord. Lord, I pray you strengthen your church today, Lord, and that we walk out of the back doors or the side door at the end of this, Lord, being more equipped, being strengthened, and Lord, to know you just that little bit more. I give this message into your hands in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So good morning, church. And I'd say church because that's the message this morning. It's on the church. You know, we see so many churches these days around the world that are emptying out for one reason or another, whether it's COVID or pandemic or whether it's lack or loss of faith, people are walking away from the church. So what do we mean by church? In order to understand what church is, I believe we have to go back to the wilderness We were in the wilderness uh, a few weeks ago when uh, we were talking about how the people were grumbling and complaining to Moses about having a lack of food and a lack of water. And they they grumbled to Moses that he would go and seek the Lord on their behalf. And there's so much to learn from that time in the wilderness. And I'm going to go back there in regards to the thirst of the Israelites. They'd come out of Egypt and they were complaining to Moses again, give us water. So I'm going to be turning to Exodus 17, you can turn with me, and then I'm going to go to Numbers 20. So we'll start in Exodus 17, and it says, Then all the congregation of the children of Israel set out on their journey from the wilderness of sin, according to the commandment of the Lord, and camped in Rephaim, Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. This is at the very beginning, this is the Exodus This is when they came out of Egypt. They were delivered from slavery. And it says, The people contended with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. So Moses said to them, Why do you contend with me? Why do you tempt the Lord? The people thirsted there for water, and the people complained against Moses and said, Why is it you've brought us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? Moses cried out to the Lord, saying, What should I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. This is what the Lord said to Moses. Go on before the people. Take with you some elders of Israel. Take in your hand your rod with you that struck the river and go. Behold, I will stand before you in the rock of Horeb and you shall strike the rock and water will come out and the people may drink. Moses was obedient. He did this. He he knew he needed to sort the Lord. He sought the Lord and he said to strike the rock once and once only. He did it in obedience and water came from that rock. This was at the very beginning of this 40 years. You know, we look back at this obedience of Moses, the back at the beginning of the 40 years in the wilderness of sin. And as Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11, he says that these things are given for our learning in the Old Testament. And he's in particular talking about this 40 years in the wilderness. He's saying this is given for our admonition. Admonition means it's a warning for us. When we read this, we've got to understand that we are getting a warning from people in the wilderness, a warning from the behaviours of the people of Israel. It's an image of the church today. And if you turn with me to Numbers 20, this is the second recorded account where the people complain to Moses about thirst. And this is at the end of of the 40 years when they're about to enter into the promised land. This is at a place called Kadesh. And the people, again, complained. This is the next generation of people. And this is at the end of the 40 years. And I could, you could sort of get an impression of how Moses would be at this stage, having contended for 40 years with these people. This is what Moses, this is what happened. It says, So Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly to the door of the tabernacle of meeting. And they fell on their faces, and the glory of the Lord appeared before them. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take the rod, you and your brother Aaron, and congregation together. 
Gather the congregation together. Speak to the rock before their eyes, and it will yield its water. Thus you should bring water for them out of the rock and give drink to the congregation and their animals. So Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him. This is the commandment of the Lord. God has, so Moses knew he needed to seek the Lord on the matter. This is something he'd been doing over the last 40 years. He sought the Lord again. He, he knew the importance of this, of this complaining. He knew the importance of the grumbling from a stiff-necked people. He sought the Lord so much he fell on his face in front of the Lord. And he pleaded with the Lord, you know, what am I to do with these people? And this is Moses. I get this impression that Moses is worn out. You know, his body is probably more worn out than his sandals and his clothes. It says in the wilderness that even their shoes and their clothes didn't wear out. But if I get this impression, Moses is worn out. He's sick of it. And he sought the Lord. He fell on his face in front of the Lord and said, what do I do with these people, Lord? They're complaining about water again. God in his grace and in his mercy gave a commandment to Moses to fix the situation, he, to give him the solution, to give him the keys to unlocking that issue. The commandment. Then it all starts to go a bit wrong for Moses. It says in verse 10, And Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock, and he said to them, Hear now, you rebels, must we bring water for you out of this rock? This is serious. The Lord never told Moses to go and stand in front of the assembly and address the assembly or the congregation. He never said to do that. And all of a sudden, Moses walked into disobedience or unbelief and he addresses the people of Israel and says, Hear now, you rebels. Moses was getting angry with the assembly. God never asked him to do that. Then he says, must we bring water out of the rock? Again, disobedience and belief, unbelief. Must we bring water from the rock? You know, this is Moses. This is Moses who saw his rod turn into a snake. Moses with the ten plagues of Egypt, Moses that stood in front of the Red Sea and that was parted and the people could walk through into the promised land or into the wilderness to head to the promised land. And he says, must we do this? Moses putting, him on, putting himself on the same level as God? This is serious business. Then Moses lifted his hand, struck the rock twice with his rod. Water came out abundantly. <clears throat> And the congregation and their animals drank. This is the third issue here. Moses didn't speak to the rock. He struck the rock twice. And I can see Moses almost filled with anger, filled with rage. Must, must I do this again for you? Putting himself in some position that God hadn't placed him in. You know, must I go out and hit the rock so you, you, know, you can get water to drink? God never asked him to strike the rock. He asked him to speak to the rock. Moses walked into disobedience again. Three times he did something that he wasn't asked to do. He got angry at God's people. They're God's people, not Moses. He got angry at God's people. He then said, must, must we bring water from the rock? Must me and God do this for you? Then the third thing there is he got angry again, striking the rock. It's interesting in both passages there, both stories of the rock and the water, they're referred to as the rock. The rock, and in the very beginning there, near Mount Sinai in Horeb, it's a long way from where this is. This is in Kadesh at the end of the 40 years, about when they're about to enter the promised land refers to the rock. Are we getting the idea here who the rock is? Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 10 verses 3 to 4, he says that they all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. For that drink, for, the, for they drank of that same spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Christ. 
That is the rock that followed the people of Israel through the wilderness. However you want to imagine that, that is the rock that followed God's people and provided for them. When Moses struck that rock twice in the end there, water still come out of it because that is a gracious God that intervenes for his people, not Moses. See, Moses was disobedient. Moses was unbelieving. And this is tough to say for a man of the faith. This is one of the, the forefathers of our faith, of the Abrahamic religions. This is a man that is revered, a man that the people, the religious people in Christ's time, trusted over Christ. And they elevated the law instead of Christ. Moses didn't understand or he rejected the commandment from God. And it was unbelief and it was to his detriment. It says here in verse 12, this is what the Lord said to Moses. The Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron and said, because you did not believe me. To hallow me in the eyes of the children of Israel. Therefore, you shall, you shall not bring this assembly into the land which I have given them. This is tragic for Moses. I, I, my heart really goes out to this man. You know, from what we would see as a man justified to give out to the people of Israel for their unbelief or their grumbling or their complaining, a man that was probably worn out of 40 years of contending with the people of Israel. We could probably see that in our flesh as justified. But we can't. We've got to look at it from God's point of view and understand that it's disobedience and unbelief. And I believe we're in a church, worldwide church at the moment, and people are walking away because of unbelief. Unbelief is striking into the church. The Holy Spirit is being squashed. The Spirit is being, is being put down and people's right to speak the truth is being eroded. People are falling away from the church. I read, looked at a statistic a couple of weeks ago that over a thousand pastors a month are leaving the church. So what do we mean by church? You know, what are we building the church on? The church we see today, and I was looking when I was researching this, I was looking at illustrations, church illustrations of what the church meant when I was doing some research. And I got pages and pages and pages of a church building. I got pages of them, just buildings, church, churches. And when you speak to someone these days and you talk about what church is, I guarantee you they tell you what sort of a church, it's a building. I'm here to tell you today and God is here to tell us today that church is not a building. You are not sitting in a church today. We are the church. And that is what's been burdened on my heart for the last few weeks. And it starts back in the wilderness that Moses didn't obey God and he walked in unbelief and he didn't trust in the rock to speak to it that the water, that the sustenance would come out of it and people would drink and, be, and not be thirsty. That is what's happening in an end times church. And believe me, church, we are in end times. I 100% believe that. And the church will be pressed on all sides. But praise God, when that happens to God's people, to God's anointed and God's elect, the church will grow. You see in Iran and China, they are the fastest growing churches, not a building, in the world. Because they're persecuted, they're oppressed, they're told to shut up. They, they have to go underground, but it is growing. This is the God I serve, that even in the midst of an end times church that is being pushed down, oppressed, for whatever reason, pandemics, freedom of speech, whatever you want to call it, it's being eroded, but there are people standing up to be the church. And that's why we're here today. Every single person that has walked through those doors here this morning is here because they want to seek God with their heart. I firmly believe that. That is the church. That is the church that God is interested in. People sold out for him. People with a heart to serve him. People with a heart to speak to the rock. People with a heart not to get angry, but to trust in him. To trust in him that God will build the church. This is the people, the church. Paul writes, in, uh, when Paul writes about the church, and we're going to read from Matthew 16 shortly, 
when church is first mentioned in the New Testament, it's from the Greek word ecclesia. It simply means a called out people. A group of people, a congregation. Church, we are called out. There is no two ways about it. God is doing something in all of our hearts here today. And that is the light that will shine in the world. That is the light that is set on a hill that can't be hidden. If we turn to Matthew chapter 16. I do love Moses. Because it shows that even a perfect God can use an imperfect man. And I can relate to that. I am far from perfect. There is all of us have fallen short of the glory of God. But God is gracious and he still provides. Even in our weakness, his strength, his strength comes through. His strength is perfected. Starting in verse 13, you can follow along with me here. It says, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples saying, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? This is not long after they had just left the Sea of Galilee and they'd seen the feeding of the multitudes, seeing miracle after miracle. Jesus would often, as he often did, would, he retreated with his disciples. Actually, the other account of this says that he actually was up praying. Like Jesus would do, he'd retreat and spend time with the Father. And Caesarea Philippi was a Gentile region of a false god. Caesarea Philippi simply means Philip's Caesarea. It was named after Caesar, and it was Philip the Tetrarch that built that city. And he had built it on top of a city that was already there, and that city's name was Paneus. Paneus was known and named after the god, the Greek god, Pan. So Pan became Paneus, and Jesus, in the shadow of this Gentile town of, or city of idol worship, you know, Pan is, we're still seeing Pan, Pan's influence today. You know, people pay, play the Pan flute. You know, we watch Peter Pan. It was inspired by this idol, this Greek god. And Pan was the, the Greek false god of desolate places. So in a Gentile region, in a spiritually desolate place, Jesus asks a question. He says, who do you say that I am? Who do you say the Son of Man is? This is how they responded. He said, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. See, Jesus wasn't interested in popular opinion. He didn't care what the people thought or, or thought he was. He knew what the people were saying about him. That he knew that people thought he was one of the prophets returning. He thought... Well, people thought he was John the Baptist, Jeremiah, even Moses or Isaiah. He thought that he was being returned as a prophet. Even Herod actually said after John the Baptist died and Jesus was performing miracles, he said, had John the Baptist returned from the dead? Jesus wanted to know who they thought he was. And what we see here in a minute is Jesus is not looking for their opinions. He's looking to found and install a church. He turns to them and says, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ. You are the son of the living God. Now this is the first time we see in the word that someone has confessed these two things together. You are the son of the living God. You are the Christ. You are the anointed one. You are the chosen one. You are the son of the living God. You are God in the flesh. This was a divine revelation given to Peter. It did not come from his flesh. It came from God. This is the first part of the foundation of the church. Not a building. People. Divine revelation. Confession. And it says in the word that when we come to believe in Christ, in his death and resurrection, that we believe in our hearts and we confess with our mouth. That is how we put a foundation down to our faith. 
This is the foundation of the church. This is what Jesus, this is his intention. In the shadow of a false god, in a Gentile region, in a desolate place, in a spiritually desolate place. Both of these places were desolate. Moses and 40 years with the Israelites in desolate places. And I've been, I have done the breadth, the length and breadth of the Sinai Peninsula. And I can tell you, it is desolate. There is not much out there, but I tell you what there is, there's plenty of rocks. But we're talking about the rock. We're talking about the rock. Like David would say, lead me to the rock in that Psalm 61 that is higher than I. This is the rock. And Jesus says, I don't care who you think I am. I want to hear what God says through you. I want divine revelation from my Father. Jesus answered and said to them, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, or Simon, son of Jonah. Bar means son. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. And the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. So who was the rock we built the church on? Was it Peter? I can tell you the church wasn't built on Peter. It wasn't built on a man. It wasn't built on flesh and blood. The church was not built on a tradition. It was not built on a religion or a denomination. It was not built on a thought or a question on law. It was not built on anything else. It was not built in a building. It was not contained in a house. The foundation of the church is contained in the heart. And it is built on the rock. And that rock is Christ. That rock is Jesus Christ. And only life can come from the rock. It says here that I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. This is the power that Jesus bestowed upon his church. It says in Acts, I give you power. That's the Holy Spirit. When Moses struck the rock and water came out abundantly, that was God's grace to his people. That's a representation of the Holy Spirit. See, Christ was struck once and once only. In 1 Peter 3.18, it says that Christ died once and once only, the just for the unjust, that we can have relationship and communion with God. That's the image that we get in the wilderness. This is why Paul wrote in Romans 15, 4, that this is a learning for us. The wilderness experience there, this is for us to learn. To be, this is a warning for us. God only asked Moses once to strike the rock. The next time God sought, uh, Moses sought God on the rock and the thirst of the people, he said, you need to speak to the rock. He didn't say strike it again because Christ was struck on the cross he died and rose again once and once and once only and that's what Christ said to his disciples was that I must go away and it will benefit you but I must go away so I can send the Holy Spirit. The Christ, Jesus, had to be struck on the cross. It said that the shepherd was struck. He was struck on the cross once and the Holy Spirit came and dwelt within his people and dwelt within his church. That was the manifestation of the Spirit through the death and resurrection of Jesus. Once and once only. That cross behind me doesn't have Jesus hanging on it. It's empty because he died once and once only on the cross. When Moses struck the rock, God was upset and angry. I can feel he was angry with Moses. Didn't love him any less, but God wanted him to speak to the rock. In Matthew 27, when Christ died on the cross, it said that the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. It said that there was a great earthquake and the rock split under that cross. And I've been to Jerusalem, I've seen that rock under where they believe Jesus was crucified and it's split. It's behind a big set of a big bit of glass. It is split down the middle. The rock had to be struck. 
for the Holy Spirit to be sent to manifest and dwell within his church. And that's what the Lord, the Lord has been burdening on my heart for the last few weeks. That church, are we operating in the Spirit? Do we keep putting Jesus back up on the cross? Or are we speaking to the living God? Are we speaking to Christ because he made a way, he made an avenue to God that we can have communion and relationship with him? That we can do that in the Spirit? That we believe that Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father and we, he's not continually put back on the cross? He was struck once and once only for us in, that we may come to him and have forgiveness. That is the whole point of our walk, that when we believe we ask for forgiveness and he cleanses us with the redeeming blood of the Lamb. See, Peter was originally named, he was renamed by Christ. He said, you'll be called Cephas, which means a stone. A stone, not a rock, a stone. Actually, that was in the, in the Aramaic, in the, in, the, in the Greek. That was in the Aramaic, in the Greek. He actually says, Petra, Peter is Petros or translated as little stone, whereas Petra is rock. So he's saying to Peter, Peter, that confession didn't come from you, it came from God. And the church is not built on you, Peter, fleshly man, as much as I love you, fleshly, disobedient, unbelieving at times, like all of us can be, I'm building it on me, Petra, the rock, the rock of ages. That is what the church is built on today. We need to have our foundations deeply rooted on a foundation that is immovable. An immovable rock that was already struck and sent his Holy Spirit. And that's how we're supposed to operate. In the Spirit. Church, we're sitting in a beautiful building. And I, I, I am so grateful. And we've only been here a, a few years, but... I am so grateful that we have such a beautiful building to worship, to praise, to hear the word. God is very gracious. But we've got to understand and we thank God. And as, as Deck would say, we pray for the building. We have hearts for it. And we have to be good custodians with the things that God has given us. But we can't lose sight that we are the church. We cannot lose sight that we are built on the rock of Christ. And we can't lose sight that the Holy Spirit flows from the rock. See, the church is not built on this building. It is not built on Peter. It is not built on Moses. It is not built on the law or the religious institution that opposed Christ when he walked this earth. The biggest opponents to Christ was religion. The religious people. The people that elevated the law and you must do all of these things to, to get salvation. And Christ said, no, you must come to me, the rock, the source of the spirit and the source of sustenance. This is the Christ I serve. This is the Christ that we need to put our foundations in for this church. This is the world church. We're in a bit of strife in the world at the moment. But praise God, I have a God that's in control. I have a God who has his church deeply rooted in his heart. You know, this is the Christ. This is the Christ that came to earth as a man humbly when all of Israel, all throughout the Old Testament, were, were expecting this, this warrior king to come and do something earthly for them, defeat Rome. You know, the whole Old Testament is the anticipation and the expectation of Christ, the expectation of the Messiah. And he comes and he looks completely different from what they were expecting. He comes and people are expecting him to overthrow Rome and overthrow the government. And when he didn't, and he went in rags to a cross and was crucified, people thought he was a fraud. But I tell you what, church, when you think something is going one way, God will do something different. Because he says, my ways are not your ways. My ways are higher than your ways. This is God. God does things that we don't expect at times. Takes you in a direction that he doesn't, that we don't understand at times. But this is the faith and the belief we must have that when he speaks to us and he says, speak to the rock, that we speak to the rock. And he brings water abundantly out for his people. That's a gracious God. Gracious God. 
So the church is built on two things. That confession, a divine revelation, that Christ, that, that God gave through Peter. Small stone. In 1 Peter chapter 2, Peter writes about this. In 1 Peter, you can turn with me if you wish. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 to 6, Peter writes, Coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. You also, as living stones, are being built up into a spiritual house. Not bricks and mortar, not a building, a spiritual house. A holy priesthood to offer up sacri- uh, spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God. Through who? Christ Jesus, the rock. This is what the spiritual house is built on. Christ and what he did for us at the cross. That's the power of the church. And the gates of Hades will not prevail. This is sin. And he gave power to Peter. But the symbol of it, he gives keys to Peter. He gives a rod to Moses. These are inanimate objects. The idea of that is authority. He gives his church the authority. Not Peter. Peter didn't have the authority, although he would be blessed as a founding father of the church. It's on the rock and the keys to Hades was to unlock the fact that we can walk from death to life. And Jesus said when he was holding the keys in Revelation, he says he holds the keys to death and Hades. He owns it now. He defeated it. He made a way. He tore the veil in the temple so people could now go without seeking a priest or having to sacrifice animals, could go into the Holy of Holies and have communion with God. That's what the church needs to be doing today. I feel blessed to be part of this church that elevates Christ as the rock. I feel blessed today that the word of God is taken so seriously. I feel blessed today that we have unity in diversity because we are a diverse bunch of people. Make no, uh, there is, no, there's, there's no means about it. We are diverse. But that is what God wants. He wants diversity because that brings unity. When we found on the rock and we place our church foundation on Jesus Christ and that confession of believing in your heart and confessing with your mouth and we start our foundational walk with him, we, we, we build on the rock. And when we speak to the rock, he sends his Holy Spirit and he does it the way he wills. See, in Corinthians 1, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we see that we have unity in the Spirit and this is through diversity. This is what Paul writes. There are diversities of gifts but the same Spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. There are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healings, by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things. This is the important bit. Distributing to each one individually as he wills. This is church. When we speak to the rock who died and rose again for us, he sends his Holy Spirit. When we speak to him, when we hunger and we thirst for righteousness, when the church seeks out Christ and says, I thirst, Lord, we speak to Christ. And he sends us the Holy Spirit. He made the way. And we are diverse in spiritual gifts. One will prophesy. One will speak in tongues. One will have an interpretation of tongues. One will have a word of knowledge, a word of wisdom. 
These are the gifts of the Holy Spirit. These are the gifts that build up the church on the rock. We are not to despise the gifts. We are to encourage them. But it's by standing on the rock of Christ. When we start elevating one of the gifts, we take our eyes off Christ. And we hear so many messages where we take our eyes off Jesus. When, Jesus, when Peter took his eyes off Jesus, when he walked on water, he sank. You know, when we take our eyes off of the plough and we start um, furrowing, well, uh, crooked furrows, we hear so much about taking our eyes off Christ. And this is no different. Spurgeon actually says that if, we, if a preacher is getting up and not preaching Christ, then he needs to get off. That's who I'm preaching this morning, Christ the rock. Christ the rock that brings water. Christ the rock that brings the Holy Spirit. This is the God I serve and this is the God the church, the church in this world serves and we cannot lose sight of it. We've got to put our foundation on the rock and not elevate anything else but him. We do not elevate a gift. We do not elevate a ministry. We do not elevate an activity. Anything that's going on in this centre is to benefit the kingdom, but we don't elevate it. We elevate the rock of Christ, who isn't on that cross anymore. He's risen. He's a risen Lord. When we start building the church on things like buildings and people and men, it will fail. It will fail. It will be moved. As Jesus said, you cannot build on the sand because you'll be washed away. As soon as a storm comes, it'll go. It'll be removed. You build on the rock, it's eternal. Jesus is doing something eternal today. And nothing's changed since the beginning when he spoke to Peter and he said, who do you say that I am? And he said, you are the Christ. You are the son of the living God. Truth, revelation from God. We cannot elevate and, and church, I feel burdened about this in the last few weeks. We cannot elevate anything else but Christ. People in the world, as Kelly was saying, then their eyes were closed. People are blinded to the truth. We're not. We have our eyes open because we've accepted Christ and we're led to the rock. You know, the world will elevate anything else but Jesus now. You know, will elevate a tradition and say, that's your way into heaven. It'll elevate a question on law or a, a question that doesn't matter in here, a difference. A religion's elevated over Christ. You know, Gautama Buddha's elevated over Christ. He's a false idol. Muhammad is elevated. Mary's elevated. We have all of these things that are elevated above the rock and we can't do it, church. We need to build on Christ. I can't say this enough. I am burdened with this this morning. This is the end times church. If we do not place our foundation on the rock, we will fall and we will fail. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Lord I believe that um, that's it. That's what you want the church to hear, Lord. Lord, Father, I just lift up this message to you, Lord. I ask, Lord, that it is it, nothing but glorify you, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for the foundations you have placed in this world, Lord, for your eternal church, Lord. And I thank you for everyone that is here in this building today, Lord. That is the church the called out ones, the called out people and the congregation, Lord. I pray, Heavenly Father, that we continue to thirst and hunger for righteousness and that we are blessed in this place, Lord. And I thank you for the provision in the natural and in the world that you have given us, this church and this centre, Lord. But I pray even more, Lord, with thanks, with a thankful and grateful heart, Lord, that you have drawn a people unto you. That, Heavenly Father, that even in a time where churches are being emptied out, People are walking away from the faith and people are, are, are being tossed to and fro like double-minded men. That, Lord, we stand firm and people are growing in this place, Lord. A people with a heart 
for you, Lord, sold out for you, Lord. Lord, I pray for your church this day, Lord. I pray, Heavenly Father, that there's unity in this church, Lord, that we continue to bind each other together, Lord, on the rock, Lord, and that as little stones, Lord, we build the spiritual house and a royal priesthood on the immovable rock. Lord, Father, do a mighty work. Lord, today we speak to the rock, Lord Jesus Christ, and I do not want to speak about you like you're not here amongst us. I want to speak to you, Lord Jesus Christ, like you are standing in our midst. And Lord, that the spiritual sustenance comes from you, Lord. That gifts, ministries come from you, Lord. But Lord, they are yours. They will return to you. That Lord, nothing will stand but you, the rock. That everything will pass away and fail. Prophecies will come and go. Tongues will cease. But you stand firm. You are the rock of ages. Lord Jesus, lead us to the rock that is higher than us that is higher than the church, that we may operate in power, that we may elevate your name in an end times church, Lord. Lord, I give you this message. Lord, I just pray you are glorified, Lord. Let your spirit manifest in this place. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.